The double slit experiment was first proposed by Thomas Young in the year 1800 and carried out also by Young a year later as a way to test the wave-like nature of light. At the time there were two competing theories, one proposed by Newton arguing that light was made out of particles and the other one originally proposed by Huygens which stated that light behaves like a wave. Now Young's experiment consists of a source of light followed by a plate with two small apertures that allows light to pass through and be detected at a screen. Now, if light is made out of particles traveling in straight paths, all we should see at the screen are two well-defined bands right where the light passes through. On the other hand, if light is a wave, and here for simplicity, we are assuming this is a monochromatic wave, so basically a wave of a single wavelength traveling from the source to the plate, it will generate two overlapping waves right past the slits that can interfere with each other. So what we would see at the screen is a fringe pattern of bright and dark bands. The bright bands are regions where the waves interfere constructively, and the dark bands are where they interfere destructively, canceling each other out. Very much like what happens when two water waves interfere with each other. So what is happening at different points in the screen is that the relative phase between the waves traveling from the top and bottom slits is continuously varying due to the difference in length of the path each one of them has to travel. And this was precisely what Young observed in his experiment. Now, in the early 1900s comes the discovery of quantum mechanics, which had two major implications for this experiment. First, that light is in fact made out of particles called photons, and that matter particles, like electrons, behave like waves. So the question is, what happens in the double slit experiment if we send one particle at a time? Well, the theory is very clear about this, and it says that we should in fact see an interference pattern. But this was very hard to believe until an actual experiment was carried out. Now, when this experiment was finally performed, we could see that the electrons, which are sent one at a time, at first seem to behave like individual localized particles, landing randomly on the screen. But as more and more particles accumulate, the interference pattern emerges. So why does this happen? Well, what quantum mechanics says is that even particles like electrons are fully described by a wave function, which here we are denoting with the Greek letter psi. Now, what's shown here on the left is a double slit experiment where we have an electron but what this bright object represents is not a solid localized particle, but rather the probability density of finding that electron in a given location on this plane. So the regions that are brighter correspond to locations where the particle is most likely to be found. Now, this particular preparation of an electron is what is known as a Gaussian wave packet. But these details are not that important. What really matters is that the underlying wave function psi is a wave and therefore it can interfere with itself. So in the simulation, what we see is the particle going through the slits on the plate and creating the same type of pattern of constructive and destructive interference we typically see for classical waves, like water waves. Then when the wave reaches the screen, it will have some probability distribution of being found in some locations more than others and will be localized by a process known as quantum measurement. The particular place where the particle is measured is completely probabilistic, but the statistics are fully determined by how the wave function looks like right at the screen. Another thing to note here is that there is a large probability of the wave reflecting back and therefore finding the particle on the left side of the plate. But here we're just going to focus on the experiments in which the particles are detected on the screen. So after running this experiment several times, we see the same type of interference pattern on the screen as what we get from a coherent source of light. Another interesting result that emerges from this experiment is the pattern that is observed at the screen if we try to measure through which slit the particle went through. So let's say we, for example, send an electromagnetic wave with a wavelength small enough to discern which slit the electron went through. What we observe is that just like in the measurement that takes place on the screen, 
the particle gets localized right at the slits with 50% probability of being found going through the top slit and 50% probability being found going through the bottom slit. However, right after the measurement takes place, the particle immediately starts behaving like a wave again, making its way to the screen. Now what we observe after running the experiment several times is that the fringe pattern on the screen obviously disappears because we no longer have two waves interfering with each other, but only one wave traveling from either the top slit or the bottom slit. Now you might say, well, wait a second, here we're saying that the particles always behave like waves. But I've seen experiments where particles actually behave like localized objects traveling through space. Like for example, in this experiment of a radioactive element in a cloud chamber, clearly emitting alpha particles and electrons. Well, the caveat here is that these particles are constantly interacting with molecules and photons in the environment around them, which basically constitutes as performing a continuous measurement of the position of that particle across space. But if we were to place this chunk of material in a vacuum, the particles will indeed be described by a wave function and will only be found somewhere in space if a measurement is performed. Now, the remaining part of this video is a bit more technical, but these details will be crucial when we map this experiment onto a quantum circuit that can be used to simulate this problem. So what we want to do next is show mathematically why is it that we see an interference pattern at the screen. So first off, we need to recall that a particle is fully described by its wave function psi, which in this problem consists of a superposition of the wave emerging from the top slit plus the wave from the bottom slit. Now to simplify this problem, we will assume that we are dealing with a plane wave rather than a Gaussian wave packet like the one we showed previously. So here A1 and A2 are the distances from the top and bottom slits respectively to some arbitrary XY coordinate on this plane. It is also worth noting that here we're saying that this wave function is proportional to this summation and not necessarily equal because this on its own is not normalizable. But we can assume that this term is, for example, pre-multiplied by some other function that guarantees that the probabilities add up to one. If we evaluate x at the screen distance d and assume this value is much larger than the separation between the slits, we can simplify our equation and show we get this cosine term, which after computing the probability density by taking the square of our wave function, this gives us an interference pattern at the screen as a function of y. Now due to our simplification in which we assume an incoming plane wave and ignore the effects of a single slit diffraction, we won't see it the interference with this exponential decay as we move away from the center of the screen, but instead we simply get the oscillatory term, but this is really all we need to understand why the interference exists. Now, in the case where we perform a measurement right at the slits, what we get instead of a superposition of the two waves is either the wave from the top slit or that from the bottom slit which is a single plane wave from either the distance A1 or A2. If we evaluate x at the screen, then we get a wave function with only one of these two exponential terms, either the one with a positive sign or the negative sign. So when computing the probability density, all we get is a constant value of one. This means that instead of getting an interference pattern, all we get is a straight line which basically denotes an equal likelihood of finding the particle at any point in the screen. So having now established all these details about how the double slit experiment works, in the next video we'll see how we can actually construct a quantum circuit that behaves in a very similar way to what we have described here. And then after that we'll go into the same level of detail for the delay choice quantum eraser to really understand what's going on in this very mysterious experiment.